It brings us to more about what U.S. capital is about, and really the founding of the company um, what is really based around bringing middle market, larger financing vehicles and financing capabilities to smaller companies. And the same with investment products. To take investment products that generate a good rate of return generally are only available to very large and wealthy investors or institutions. And so we have a dual-edged mission, and one is to bring financial products down to smaller companies, and the second is to provide um, financial um, investment opportunities to smaller investors, um, you know, high net worth or, or um, uh, smaller family offices, and kind of spread that ability, and even we even have some retail products now for uh, millennials. So it, it's to kind of spread that, because if you create more income opportunity for more people, it creates more capital in the marketplace, and if your focus is on smaller businesses, it's proven corollary to um, higher job creation, and and so it's it's inherently, you know, that model makes money because we're in the transaction business, right? But also, what we do kind of generates a social good. If we can provide more financial lubricity down in that sector, then there'll be more jobs created and. And, uh, and, and, uh, and that's obviously a social good. Um, and then also if you can generate a little more yield with a certain part of more investors' portfolio, that's also good because you know, people have retirement issues they have to deal with and a lot of people are concerned to uh, have to start uh, having investment income that makes sense because they, they, they're not sure they can count on government pensions and things of that nature. So that's, that's really the essence of what we do. And, we um, and what what we what from inception we've wanted to do, and and we also work closely with uh, referral sources and advisors, financial advisors, and people like that. That's generally our pipeline of uh, of investors or transactions. So we try to play within the ecosystem, financial ecosystem, with other other players by adding innovative products there rather than taking market share from existing from existing business. We try to add innovative products that actually expand the market rather than contract it. But you can see that our, our, our whole way of thinking is a little more cooperative rather than um, competitive, I think you would say. And also, as far, from a company standpoint, uh, for just from the business model, which I've elaborated on. Now, from a company standpoint, we also favor, or we like to look at, the, as the transactions I outlined, or what we like to look at is companies that do have a positive impact in general on their communities, and whether it's job creation or uh, direct uh, impact for individuals through med tech or uh, uh, community development because the business is in a uh, developing country or it's a healthful product, things like that. We're drawn towards that, and we tend to uh, uh, favor deals like that. Um, we'll do, we will do some strictly economic deals because economic growth is good in and of itself. But we generally avoid um, uh, sectors that uh, are, maybe aren't perceived or we don't think is so positive for society. We're just generally not so attracted to them. And oddly enough, people in the, with strict financial transactions that aren't very beneficial aren't really attracted to us either. So it's not like we have to really fight them off. But we do, there, you notice there is quite a bit of attraction, either whether it's our personnel or um, transactions or investors that have that similar kind of uh, vibration or they're really interested in impact. So it does attract a certain type of people to be around us. And we're a pretty diverse co company, you know, we're very, um, you know, we always base the people that we're around or that we hire based on their talents, not so much about what country they're from or, you know, where they went to school or anything like that. We're kind of, a, we're a talent-based organization. And um, so you'll see, if you come into the office, you'll see quite a bit of diversity, whether it's, you know, women, men and women, or um, uh, things that are just different ethnicities or whatever. It's really a talent-based company. And the other thing we try to do, and this is a little bit weird to talk about, but there's a lot of discussion of social interaction, whether it's political or sexual orientation or has, harassment. We try, we, we really try to have a culture where it's gentlemanly or ladylike, right? Because if people, you know, they, they try to set, I mean, when you're a little lost 
ethically, you try, you have to set a lot of rules and things like that. And we said, well, we try not to hurt people's feelings, right? And so you hurt people's feelings by if they're a certain way, right? Or they dress a certain way, we try not to hurt their feelings about it, right? It's like, okay, it's just a style, right? Or it's a feeling. Or uh, if, if, if you're making unwanted advances towards people, it's not polite. It hurts their feelings, right? So we tried, I try to keep a, that kind of a culture where we, we, we try to be, I mean, it's a bank. I mean, you know, we, you know, we're a business. We're uh, aggressive and smart in a lot of ways. But we do try to maintain that individual politeness and the point of respect and not, and ba basically, if you don't hurt people's feelings, you're probably well within the law. <laughs> it's kind of the way we look at it. So, and that's the way we operate from a regulatory standpoint. What's the spirit of the regulation? If you operate within the spirit, more than likely you're quite well in, within the bounds of the written regulations. Now, you need to keep an eye on that as well because you don't want to inadvertently step out of some regulation, but we try to be philosophically driven and you know, uh, intention driven, and that it helps guide us to stay within the bounds of decency, the law, the regulation, things of that nature. So I think you'll find that uh, in our company. And, and then um, lastly, we're quite technologically innovative, right? Because if you're dealing with smaller transactions in a, in a smaller cap marketplace, the reason there's not a lot of good service in that sector from the past is the complexity and expense of the transaction cost, right? Not enough commissions are generated down there to attract the talent that can execute those transactions. Now, by the use of technology, we can reduce some of the friction and some of the cost in that sector, and you can do a few more transactions, generate similar amounts of fees, but uh, in general, the fees are smaller, the smaller transaction. But by using technology, you can generate more fees so you can push those services down there and still be a profitable investment bank. So that's part of our DNA. We use, uh, what do we use? We use a lot of digital marketing and big data analysis of our database, um, things of that nature. We use investment platforms. We use, there's some innovative regulations that have come out about advertising offerings and things like that. Very few people use those. And we use, uh, we exclusively use general solicitation and wide advertising of opportunities. Uh, and that's an innovative uh, regulatory um, uh, advantage that we have. And then we have investment platforms. You can see our offerings online, you know, like you never could before. And uh, we can digitally market and advertise them uh, either through uh, social media or we use email or we use press releases, things like that. So that's relatively innovative. Lastly, um, in an emerging sector is uh, venture secondary. So there's a lot of pre-IPO companies that aren't going IPO as soon as a lot of investors have wanted to. And a lot of these venture funds, they have a horizon of their investor investment. They may have to be in for eight years, start harvesting investments at five so they can get out. Some of these pre-IPO companies has been, you know, past five years and they're not out. So, some, so these uh, uh, earlier investors need liquidity for their investors. So we do have, we do use an alternative trading system platform for relatively large blocks of alt investments. And uh, that uh, is getting very, very busy because, again, a lot of people are choosing not to go IPO, and so their early investors need out. And so we can do trade, you know, three to five million dollar blocks of alternative investments or uh, pre-IPO, you know, the, the usual names, usual suspects in that area. And I think, I mean, philosophically and looking ahead, I think you look into ICO, you look into blockchain. I think you'll probably find in the future, and we're, we're starting to do that a little now, is the private securities, even the smaller private securities, we're starting to do and we're working on uh, keeping a blockchain ledger of the, uh, of the security itself, so that in the future when there's w more wide adoption of digital um, ledgers for uh, uh, capitalization charts and then the shareholders, that when there's wider adoption at the grassroots level, then they'll, they'll develop marketplaces where you can trade those securities. So right now, the only real trading in secondaries are big, big blocks, you know, big companies, pre-IPO. But there'll come a time when these smaller securities also will have a secondary market, not unlike the stock market. So we are on the edge of that, and we've been looking carefully at uh, best practice in the sector and what's, 
what's going to leave? I mean, again, you go back to um, you go back to what's the uh, what's the philosophy behind regulation in this sector? It's investor protection. So you really have to think if you're going to use a system like that. At first, it might look like a free-for-all, unregulated world, but we're really looking at it like, well, how is it going to be regulated? Let's make sure we set up our practices that are going to meet the inevitable regulation that happens in the sector, rather than cowboy it out outside the uh, norms. Because it, things like that, when it, be, when it affects consumers, when it affects investors, things of that nature, the, the regulators are tasked to protect them, and they will make all their regulations around that kind of protection. So uh, it, it'll be relatively convention, conventional in the protections. So that's, we're looking at that. So that's about it.